pausing for AV. I'm good. Okay, great. So I'm going to start. Um, I'm going to whine about exceptions, uh, and, and I'm not. So, 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 you know, first meta question. I'm not trying to solve Java's exceptions. I'm trying to say if we had a clean slate, what would it look like? And I will present shortly, like five minutes or less, and then you know, Rime here will rip out and say coroutines and and go to town with it. Um, so, so the 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 obvious fail modes for Java. Um, there's the whole checked exception thing, which programmers love to catch, throw away the stack trace, print something useless, throw a different unrelated exception, usually a runtime to get around the checked exception piece, and when you finally get to do something about the exception, you've lost any information that you needed to actually understand what the hell to do. So, so I've lived with this model for a long time. We all have lived with it. I think we all agree it can do better. Um, I've also programmed uh, fairly extensively in, in Elm, which has a very similar model to Go. And there, there's only two kinds of exceptions. There is panic, which you shoot the process down, and you get a stack trace. And if you panic, you agree that no one else can recover from this exception. You, as the code writer, are telling everyone else, you cannot solve this problem. The application is dead now, which works great if I'm coding my own little thing. But if I call a library, it panics on me. I would not like that. Um, because maybe I can recover from the library's badness. Fine. And the other thing that Go will do is return you uh, an error code with some good syntactic sugar in the language to make it plight and easy to deal. And then everybody who calls a failable uh, um, piece of code has to check the error code and do something syntactically all the way up the call chain until they reach a spot where maybe something can happen. And I claim that um, it's more or less Go demands syntactic uh, 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 handling if I know for a fact that I'm not going to do anything about an exception if it comes through. I'm just going to say, uh, I don't know, and throw again, and throw again, and throw again, until somebody comes along and can deal with it. And is there a better way? And I'll throw out my straw man and my straw test case, and then I'll give up the mic here. Um, so the straw man is, uh, I have totally been in the case where I get sort of low-level I.O. errors for which I, ha I wrap a reliability layer around it. And I've done this both around UDP and around TCP channels to S3, which decides I'm doing a DDoS attack, so it cuts me off in the middle. And, I, and the next layer up doesn't want to know that S3 is being bad about TCP sockets. So I wrap a reliability layer where I catch the exceptions, and I reopen the socket, but I have to stall, or I get hit with the DDoS kill again, and I have to count and stall. And I'm basically running a TCP back off congestion protocol against S3. Um, but the layer up doesn't care. So that error was completely covered, right? Recovered from. But there might be another layer above that for which something horrendous happens and that I don't know what to do. But there's an application on top of that that says, you know, this transaction aborted and it's failed and I'm killing it now. And maybe it's a web server kills it and maybe it's uh, uh, I'm at the command line on a REPL of a cloud-backed big you know, machine learning thing and I type some junk at the REPL and something blew up in the cloud and it came back to the REPL and the REPL recovers completely and says I'll take the next command at the REPL level. And so I can imagine there's stacked layers and the layers got pretty deep and I don't want to be doing the go thing of testing every exception, every layer up as I unwind and unwind. And some of my unwinds totally recover, but they're complicated. Like that node threw an error, so I'm going to catch it, and I'm going to claim it's done for that node, but I'm going to pass it over the wire to the caller of that node who did an RPC, and he's going to get the error back, and he's going to unwind some count of layers. God knows it could be many, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So, so is there another way other than Java's checked exceptions, which people love to catch, throw away critical information, log something useless, and rethrow, or goes, which is either, boom, you're dead, there's no recovery, or else you must handle a token back, and, and, and I'm done. Coroutine. <laughs> now, now explain. Now, um, so um, basically, uh, you are at some point um, um, uh, with an exception, you will have the unwind automatically. What coroutine gives you is the fact that you can restart exactly at the point of the failure. That just that. So you re, re fail again? <laughs> Perhaps, <laughs> but you can patch. <laughs> Different opinions. Oh, someone else. Oh, oh. 
I'm not sure I get it. So I want, like uh, Cliff said, I want an upper layer to handle the exception because the upper layer knows how to do it. So the coroutine, if I go there and restart, well, that's, that's not good enough. It's like I need an upper layer to do it. So um, basically, is, uh, what, uh, why I say coroutine, it's not uh, that you need coroutine. You need a mechanism like coroutine. When you have a coroutine, basically, you have two things. You have coroutine that you can spin, and you have a scheduler. And it's up to the scheduler to manage the exception. So instead of having the exception that uh, goes uh, back to the stack, <laughs> And, and who manages the scheduler? <laughs> Another scheduler. You have done Elm. It's exactly that. And the question here is, don't we actually need two kind of concepts? I mean, one which is part of my application design, and one which is actually part of the runtime? Basically, as a, as a developer, right, I would like to be able to, to, to say, this is my, my, my primary path, my execution path. I would like to have executed. And then in cases something is odd or something I can't handle, I would like to give, the, for example, the client the opportunity to do something about it. But that I basically would like to have exposed as, let's say, part of my API. And that's a different challenge, actually, to just basically go back to my coroutine. Yeah, but in, in that case, you are like Go. You need. I'm just, I'm just trying to separate two different, um, uh, let's say, uh, use cases here, right? I, I would like to have basically as an application API the opportunity, right, when I'm using it, right, to, as a client, to be in charge to say what should, how I would like to recover, right? And of course, I would like to have um, basically an, an, an generic concept in my, in my runtime that takes care of anything else. Two different concepts. Yes. So the question is, the, the question is, are we just discussing the basically the runtime specifics, or are we also discussing? Discuss. The conversation goes where it goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, just to illustrate a possible alternative approach. So there is the idea of coroutines, uh, callbacks are also another possibility. Uh, they're cumbersome, and no one loves callbacks, but l hear me out. Um, <laughs> so we've, we've worked for a long time on a, an FFI layer that lets you call down into C functions and do all the C calls, and typically uh, the way that C programmers do this is by checking an error code, uh, checking a return value, checking an error no in the system, uh, and then responding to it, the go way, basically, for the most part. Uh, we support that in the API. You can get the return code back. You can check what the error no was, and we save it off in a thread local so it's all safe across threads. But if when you initialize this FFI layer, you want more Java style exception handling, you can pass in a different exception handler. And then when there is an error, code, error condition on one of these calls, you can raise an error no thread that will, re or an error no exception that will represent that. You can put in the additional state. You get to define what it means to raise an exception or to handle that error condition. You can just let it bubble back out as a return value, or you can raise it, pass it off to another handler, or, or do a coroutine or something along those lines. Sounds like you did try catch. Well, yes, it is. It is a try. It's a try catch where you can pass that function in the, the catch logic, and it will handle it within the library itself rather than you handling it outside the library. So you'll have the context of the call in hand. And it's not trying to uh, tease out the information from whatever exception gets bubbled back out. So it's basically try catch uh, with, uh, with a new P things. You can weave the try catch at every point of the IO. Yeah. 
So exceptions are, are the poor man's way of doing transactions, okay? And so there's basically two classes in my mind. There's, there's the expected, you know, kinds of things. I'm writing a TCP driver. Um, I'm expecting a certain kind, sets of uh, failures that can happen. And then there's the unexpected, you know, the Spanish Inquisition comes and no one's expecting it, right? And what you want is to preserve all the clues, so you want to log, right? So we should make the VM should just ensure that when you're going through and doing exceptions, like nothing is thrown away so that you keep all the clues, right? And, and that, um, I mean, and that's really the thing, right? I mean, what is it that you don't like about, huh? You're the one that's posing the problem, Cliff, right? So, I mean, I mean, what is it that you don't like about, I mean, like, if you're throwing away clues, that's obviously bad, right? Because, like, the detective's coming along, trying to figure out why the Spanish showed up and wanted to, you know, conduct the Inquisition, right? And you threw away the clues because you, you know, unwound the stack, right? So, like, preserve all the clues in, in, in that case, right? Keep going. All right. <clears throat> Right? So don't throw anything away, right? Database people will tell you, like, never throw anything away, append only, that's the right semantics for a lot of these things. And, I mean, I think the, the thing is it happened in, in Java is they did a lot of work to make it really, really efficient, right? I mean, it, it's actually a more efficient exception me mechanism than the, the stuff we used to do in C, which is set jump along, ba jump and right. You'd have to store all the registers, you know, just in case you might need one of the registers, right? And so you actually measure exception performance in Java. It's faster than in C, right, um, if you did it with set jump along jump. Yeah, it is. Sorry, one remark. Every exception copies the entire stack trace, so they're not that well performant. You want it to be like, throw stuff away and be performant, right? Uh, um, when you create an exception, you say if you want the stack trace or not. What Remy said was that when you make an exception, you should say whether or not you want to stack trace. If you actually, if you, in Java, if you catch an exception uh, uh, very close where you throw it, and you don't do anything with the exception, and this trace is pre-cooked, then it turns into a go-to go under the hood. Like, it's in line to a go-to. But uh, otherwise, getting the stack trace is still very expensive. So separately, I would argue that you should not be using exceptions as the fast, high volume throughput thing, because that's not exceptional programming, that's some kind of weird indirect go-to logic for which I would claim we want a different answer. Right, but, yeah, I agree with that. Which means exceptions can be slow, because Except they should be exceptional. Right, but the re so the only reason not to log everything and restore, keep all the clues is, is performance. If you don't care about performance, if exceptions should be slow, I'm glad we got to that point, then just frickin' log, every log everything, you know, no delete. Wow, this is great. I can be in stereo. You have to say something too. All right. Um, no, um, just it seems that um, not all people know. So since I think Java 7, um, when you create an exception, you have something like free Boolean that says something like, I want the stack trace or not. You take a look to the Java doc <laughs> for the other option. I don't remember, but. Uh, and you can do that for exception, error, and okay. all three. So, uh, okay. So I just ha I just have a question. I, I I don't quite understand the purpose. Is this just about information preservation, or is this uh, about uh, performance, or yeah? I mean, what's this discussion about? Because I mean, the main thing I got from your complaint was that. Um, if I distill that, uh, you know, like PhD dissertation into one sentence, was that you're complaining that the information I need is now gone? Real quick, I don't own this exception, this talk, so it's about whatever people talk about. So right now we're talking about exceptional speed performance, and you're bringing it back to losing information. I think it's crucial not to lose the information. Like, don't don't lose the breadcrumbs. Okay. Here. Okay, so the, I mean, the way I understand it is that really the exceptions, I, I never really cared about performance of exceptions because it's about in getting the right information in order to understand what's going on. So my feeling is, is that are we actually even doing this all correctly? Is there not an orthogonal <clears throat> mechanism that we can use uh, that basically takes exception handling out of the realm of developers <laughs> having to? <laughs> having to do this. 
Um, uh, Cliff and I talked about this a little bit at, um, at Geekon too, and one of the things that hasn't come up yet is that in Java, it's incredibly easy and always done that we conflate exceptional results, errors, things that are bad, with like, okay, a key isn't found. Is that an error or is it expected behavior? We looked for a key in the database. Do we raise an exception for that? Why do we handle exceptions that mean things to program flow in the same way they handle exceptions that are errors in the program? And so there's a, there's a missing concept here where we have an expected output of looking up a, a record in a database that the, the record is not there. But that's often thrown as an exception that looks like out of memory or stack overflow. Uh, I would like to say that I'm a really bad programmer, but in all the books I found and I read about exceptions, all the books have this chapter at the end, like the chapter 22, there's uh, maybe three pages about exceptions and they don't explain anything or the consequence of what happens when you do actually proper exceptions or how they work. For example, what that guy mentioned about uh, in Java 7, the flag, oh sorry, it was you. Uh, so I, I find that all this information is very misleading to uh, amateur programmers and you, you see it when you go to APIs that everything is a check exception uh, and what I'm supposed to do? Catch them all. <laughs> Catch them all, yeah, that's what we always end up doing. And so and so we, end up, we end up catching <laughs> so we, we end up catching them all because we're forced to and then we don't know what to do with it and so we just throw nonsense into a log and lose all that information. So there's like, there's, there's, too, there's too few levels of what an exception is. They're all bad all the time and they're not necessarily all exceptional results. Yeah, but there is an answer for that because basically we have this runtime exception, so very unexpected exceptions where we need stack trace because w nobody expected it to happen. And exactly the problem of something doesn't exist in database and it's kind of expected by the business. And in the past we were modeling that with checked exception. But the thing is, in that case, I don't really need a stack trace. Come on, it's like I, I know where it's handled. So actually there is a good solution for that for years. Functional programming. <laughs> And a, and a concept of monad, really. It's like, so someone mentioned the Waver library, and I have conspiracy theory, it was taken out of the table. In Waver, we have <laughs> object like e either or try. There are actually tr two monads. And each of them is exactly quite well uh, useful in a concept of mm, business object hand uh, exception handling. So something that actually is might happen. And this is a business problem and you can re easily model that. Don't use checked exception for that. Use either or try. There's exactly those monads for that. Don't use callbacks. Callbacks are poor, really poorly done monads. <laughs> I mean, the cool thing about that is also that you, um, as an API provider, you uh, um, basically give away the intent. Basically, you, you, you tell basically clients, right, should do this or should that. And the problem with the exception is basically I just don't know how I can recover and what I can do with that, right? And except when I have that, that, that either thing, right, I know basically um, the one thing is the error and the one thing is the actual result I want and I can recover from, uh, from uh, that. And that, that's basically, it has a structure pro protocol, right? And I, as a client, know how to deal with that. And there's, there's even one more cool thing about, especially either try those monads, that you can compose them. That's exa exactly the, what you do with exceptions, like you have try catch on man, many levels, exactly the same thing happens functionally with monads. You can compose different exceptions to one, et, et cetera, different idols. And even more, that has one uh, more advantage over over uh, exceptions because exceptions always rise and go up the stack. Like you can only catch something that, that was inside. But actually with either monad, you can, this is just a result, just an object, and you can pass it. So we can pass someone an exception. This is something like really crazy, but it's really useful. For instance, you pass the exceptional result from database to the GUI. And it's, it's really cool. So, as, as someone who wrote a book where exceptions are covered in chapter 7 and not in chapter 22, so there's been a lot of foolishness here. Um, if you look at the Go approach, 
where you pass a return code to the caller and to the caller and to the caller. A mechanism has been invented 20 some years ago to deal with that. That mechanism is called exception handling. Um, the, the entire point of exception handling is to transfer something up the calls chain without having as the programmer to go in the middle. The problem that Java has had that's made it difficult to deal with the one situation where you lose information in an exceptional situation is that Java has made it difficult to deal, or slightly difficult to deal with checked exceptions. It actually is not rocket science to take a checked exception then to, if you have to wrap it in an unchecked exception because of the foolishness of that Java has th that checked exception in the yeah. type, you can chain the exception. It's one call and then you don't lose information. This is not something that people can't do. Well, they can't, it's the job. I know they don't do it and so, so what you might argue <laughs> That um, there is uh, there's, there's a couple of things you can learn from that. One is, you know, when you need to train them to do it. Um, the other one is you should probably uh, make it so that most of your methods simply throw exception because we can't change that aspect of Java. So right now, you know, on all the lambdas, it is a true pain. Um, you know. No, we claim we don't want to solve Java's problem like that. <laughs> okay, but so uh, if you start it from scratch, you know, don't, don't have checked exceptions. Yeah. Make it easy to chain exceptions if you yeah. want to transfer from one layer to another. And that deals pretty nicely with the exceptional situations. But I do agree there's this whole other aspect where people should, when an API uh, throws an exception because a key wasn't found in a hash table, that's not a great use of exceptions, right? In that case, using an option or an either is a much better use. So I don't think there's any one strategy, but you, know, you need, want to figure out what, what is the sensible thing you want to achieve with these exceptions. Yeah. Uh, uh, to, to add to your point, currently in Java, you have two uh, unchecked exceptions that the sole point is to wrap a Neo uh, exception. You have IO error and you have unchecked IO exception. Oh, I was used one time. <laughs> okay. So, so I, I, I'll make an effort to bring this back in, maybe. Um, actually, yeah. What, what, how, what's the time here? I'm sorry. Okay, fine. Um, so, so I, I don't want to summarize here. That's not going to work. <laughs> I think. I think I, the only thing I reason I came back in here was because somebody said, "Hey, the exception gets thrown. I don't know what to do with it." And the answer should be, "Well, if you don't know what to do with it, it should be you should not do anything, and that should be okay." And in Go, you have to do something, but maybe you can do something very little, and maybe that's okay. But if, the, if it's an exception that's getting thrown and you don't know what to do with it, you should not have to write any code and it would just unwind again, and that should be okay. Except if it's against it. No, no. I'm, I'm claiming from scratch, not rescuing Java. No, no, Java has its own issues. And it's all great to have support for a better way to do it, but people in practice don't because maybe, but don't go why they don't. They don't. And then you get stuck with the mess that comes out of it. And I'm, I'm not going there. <laughs> Since you just said go again. Um, <laughs> so um, let, me, let me get this straight. You don't think Go does it right, do you? I think Go got it better than Java did, but I think there's a better way yet. And that's what I'm trying to okay. figure out if, if people have another solution. Right. So I think there's a couple of things about how Go handles, well, they don't have exceptions, they only have errors. Um, first of all, I think, well, this like, you make, you make a call to some thing, like, an, some, some I.O. write, and for every single write, for every byte you write, you actually have to have like this. If error is an equal nil, whatever, well, return the error. Um, that, is definitely not a good syntax style. It's like the horrible thing you want, don't want to do. So what you try to do is you fall back to panic and recover from the panic. Things which is not supposed to be, but when you have, when you write a protocol and you have to do like 20, 30, 100 calls down to the IO layer, that is what you do. Because everything else just sucks. One, uh, like 100 lines of code go down to 300. Okay, so what you just said was Go exception handling sucks. Um, not, not yet. We're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, the second thing, and that is where I think it's actually worse, every time you return the error one layer down, this is not in the stack trace because the stack trace in Go is created at the point where actually panic. So if you, if you handle or hand it down the error like 20 layers, you lose all this information and that is where it really, really sucks. 
Okay, now I'm done. Okay, so, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> Is there a better way? And I don't have the right answer. And my, my straw man proposal, which I haven't heard anyone shoot down badly, was throw with the exception, you cannot, uh, 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 you cannot uh, delete information out of it. You can catch and act, but then it will rethrow unless you're the final catch. And at the final catch, you claim you have recovered. Same as your panic recover, there is a there is a catch point, which is the recovery. It doesn't rethrow. Otherwise, it's going to rethrow. But you're allowed to you know gather stats and print logs and and do maybe local recovery if that makes sense. But you're not able to throw away the stack trace. You're not able to change the type of the exception. And you don't even need a checked exception. You just need freaking string. So this is actually kind of interesting, but one, one could consider a, a, a change in semantics where if you rethrow in the catch clause that it automatically does the chaining. I, yeah, I, I would claim that that's semantically equivalent to the same exception just got thrown again for you on your behalf. But you don't lose anything. And you don't lose anything on that one either. Because it's not actually rethrowing, it just continued to propagate the same exception. So I claim this semantically equivalent. That's actually how it If you rethrow and there's an active exception. <laughs> so Ruby recently, on my urging, added the cause uh, field on exceptions, and they did add the automatic behavior that if there is a live exception on the stack at that point, and you rethrow a new one, the old one is automatically attached to it, and the chain is preserved all the way up. And that is something that actually we could do within Java that we get this automatic cause in exceptions we re-raise. Yeah, it's doable. And so, uh, isn't this a problem of, um, so I hear two problems here. One is deciding whether an exception is fatal or not, and there seems to not be a clean line where you can actually say, well, this is uncoverable completely, even out of memory error. I mean, you can catch it and clean a big array and then go on. Um, the second thing is, um, we gave programmers this ability to throw exceptions with the keyword throw. And what if we remove that ability? And so exception will actually always return as values, like in either monads, but they do retain, retain the stack trace and everything. So they can be composed and everything. So they're a bit of a special thing because they retain the stack trace, but we don't give the ability to raise them. Well, how is that different from Go? Well, I don't know. That's, <laughs> but, but you know, the go to, to me, what, what I see from like uh, Christoph is like so I see this head shake no, over here of somebody who's desperate for a mic. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it it isn't go like every time you need to check if there is an error and blah blah blah. So so, it's, so separately you have to check every time, and that's right. what I'm complaining about. But also what you got when you took the thing. If you just pass it along, you didn't lose anything, but you certainly have the opportunity to edit it before you pass it along. And right. then I, uh, that's a disagreeable thing in my head. Like, like you shouldn't lose, whoever said it, the Spanish Inquisition, you had no clue they were showing up. Don't lose any breadcrumbs on the way out. So monad syntax to, would, would be better? Like a ghost style, but monad syntax rather than if else. <laughs> The main issue with monads is uh, clearly you can see in Vaver, with Vaver, you have either and try. So uh, you can compose a monad, but you, can, you, you have a problem to compose a different monad together. If you say monad we're, we're transformer, almost you're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to face it. <laughs> I see. It's quite easy, like if you if you have uh, if you are, for instance, building something like new JDBC, and you have like open connection to database, it should in the in the for instance uh, connection is not available because something in, in the first place it should return from my uh, for the calling code something like monad because maybe the the code is able to ch change the connection to something else or whatever. But then, if, if the code is just, just, just business code I'm connecting, I know this is the database. I know, oh, I can recover. In this moment, this code will know, okay, I got a monad, but now I will convert it to 
runtime exception because I can't do anything for, for me, it's panic. So I would say this is completely different thing that we are doing right now. We have on low level IO exception, SQL exceptions, and then functional programmers, we, we wrap them into monads. Actually, that should be vice versa. In the moment you see, oh, I, I can't recover, I check it to runtime. But in the, on the always like what was checked exception before should be in my opinion monad. And by the way, try is I think only used when you already have this exception. It's just, just you shouldn't use try in the new code. It's only for wrapping old, old stuff. I will. <laughs> so what's the situation with stack trace information in the monad pattern? Okay. So in, in that uh, in that particular case, basically monad is just result. You have no stack trace. But in the moment you see, for instance, you get from this open connection, I get it's no connection, and I get an error maybe as enum, that's what you do in either, then you throw exception and exactly in this moment you create the stack trace. But this is exactly what, what we do in our libraries. We have if something happened, then we throw exception exactly in this moment. So you, you, you only construct stack trace in the moment you decide this is a panic. I can't do anything anymore. So that's the, the client of the API decides that a stack trace should, but, but I've lost the stack trace within that library. No, that not point, really. Right? No, not really. This is, the question who is the client, for instance, if I am building SQL uh, uh, library, JDBC, let's say, I am, I am a client of uh, TCP stack or something. I am a client. So TCP stack gives me uh, information that, for instance, something was, cannot be opened. But right now, I am, I am library for some other client. Right now, I, for instance, Ryzen exception. Yeah, it depends what I am doing. Yeah. So, but basically, if you look when, when our exceptions shown, it's always somewhere kind of if even now. And in this moment, it is created, always. Yeah? This doesn't happen automatically, never, basically. It, it seems like it still just moves the decision of whether this is truly exceptional or whether this is an expected result to another layer, really. And I don't, I mean, it, it, it may solve the fact that we expect essentially two return values either the actual return value we want or some uh, unexpected return value or, you know, not exceptional but, but uh, different. Uh, but it still doesn't really seem to me that it, it answers the question of there's some library, some errors happened within it. Or it, it, may be in, it may be fine for that library, but it's not fine for me, or vice versa. Maybe that library considers it critical and I don't. Um, we still have to make that decision of how we're going to do that. Is it going to have a full stack trace? Is it going to be like an actual exception with, with information so I can trace it back into that library? Or is it just going to say, well, I, I consider this a normal output. You may not, um, but you're not going to be able to figure out why this happened at that point. Okay. Okay, for me, it's always... Uh, it's, but it would be better actually to look at actual code of libraries because they exactly do this. They, uh, for something, basically something for a library that is handleable in, in the client code, you can see I, I maybe can handle or not, but the layer I'm calling, for it it's always normal try catch. For instance, like you open the file, you get some false whatever, <laughs> even now it happens in old Java IO, things like that. But then you decide that for layer below that's fatal or not. It's, it's always, there is some decision always, and even now in code of libraries, exactly there is this decision. Because you, go, you start from like native calls and they even return like minus one or something. And then you in one one decide, okay, for, for the Java code below that's panic right now. Or you can show, but I would say we should at this lower level always return not the stack trace because mostly we don't need them. Sometimes it's even performance problem if we uh, yeah, call, uh, throw thousands of stack traces. Actually, I had this. Yeah. So, so I think that what we really care about here is separating the exception from the control flow change, right? So if I'm doing matrix math and there's a divide by zero error, what I want to do is not actually throw up, you know, some stuff. I just want to put not a number there in that particular cell of the matrix where I had a problem, right? Now, of course, then I've lost the information that divide by zero is the thing that caused that not a number to be called. So maybe with what we did, okay, here's my, here's my proposed solution, right? So not a number has like actually a bunch of bits that we could use, right? Because there's a bunch of bit patterns that mean not a number in IEEE 754 flow, right? But let's just, let's just kind of assume we, we're, we're kind of rewriting, uh, you know, programming language from scratch, right? Like, you know, this, that's, your, that's your kind of uh, um, 
thought process here you started with, Cliff. So what we really want to know is, hey, it was an exception, and here's, an, here's a key off into the log with all the shit, that told, you know, all, with all the clues about what happened, right? But I want to have the I want to separate the choice of do I change control, control flow from the choice of, like, do I want clues or not, right? So if I'm doing matrix math, you know, a lot of times I don't actually want to change the control flow. I want to just, like, record it, and if someone wants to go back to later, just fine. Um, and, and somewhere up, somewhere else up the stack may know about what to do right. with control so, flow. This so I did, a, I did a big data machine learning startup, distributed cloud computing kind of thing, right? And if you get one such exception, you get billions. So, so you can't capture them all, but they're shadow reflections of each other, plus or minus a couple layers of recursion through things. So there's some stuff you do there. Um, we can go down offline, maybe. I think this conversation is about to run down, but there's there's a lot of fun things you can do in that front that I tackled it pretty hard at the H2O startup for quite a few years. So I, they're, they're, that's a long conversation, different from this one. And, and are we out of time? What's the story here? Because I'm going I'm to do it 30 seconds. Keep talking, Cliff. I got five, I'm sorry, five minutes or one minute? 15 more minutes. 15? Oh my God. 15. We're like, okay, we can rant on monads all day long. <laughs> Um, uh, just one question. You, you mentioned that in in the catch things, you don't want to rethrow something. Yeah, right. So, uh, so, so there's like, why did you catch? What was the purpose? So, if the if the if your goal is to completely recover and have no impact to the upper layer, then you should catch completely and you're done. If your goal was, I didn't know what the hell to do, why did you bother to catch? If your goal was to say, um, this was unexpected from the lower layer, but I want to log something, the log was in the stack trace already. This should only be in a pin where you're going to add other information you have, but then don't throw that away, that what was in the exception away. So however you chain it, I would claim if you just let the original stack trace live on and, and, and then it's going to get thrown, it should get thrown for you automatically because you were not completing the job. You were not the final catch. So that's what you, why did you catch? If you had something to do, what, what are your options? Well, you're either recovering completely, you're, you're doing some sort of annotation, and maybe you're doing a local partial cleanup, I don't know. But I don't see that Java does it wrong where you catch and then people do what the hell they do and then they throw or they don't and then you just lost it. I think the, the main issue is uh, in a catch block, you can do whatever you want because it's a general programming language. So how to avoid that? You're going to throw again immediately. The throw will happen for you when you leave whatever your catch is. So, so you, you register a handler, however that's done, and when the handler's done, the throw is going to continue again. Right? You just paused, ran some more stuff, and then it kept going. And the object that's getting thrown back out maintains everything it has, but maybe you can add more. There's an API to say, and also, here's some more info. I just want to really quickly answer the question, why the hell did I catch? Because the stupid language made me. I had no choice. I wanted my program to compile, which is a good property. That's a, that's and that complete language fail, totally agree. It, it is, but that is, if you look at actual programmers, why do they catch? That's why they yeah. catch. Okay. That really is at, at the root of this. If we didn't have that issue, 95% of your pain would probably yeah, go away. And, and you, you said you don't want to fix Java, but there is a simple way to fix it. Remove check it exception. <laughs> I'm not trying to solve Java's problem because that's like not done in, in, in ten minutes in this in this room. But but the reason the reason that they did that in the first place was what came before was POSIX, which you'd have error codes and people would always forget to check them, right? And so you're calling some POSIX thing, you forgot to check did the result turn out to be did the, was the file descriptor minus one? And so like it was because people didn't want to like think about it. It's the things you didn't want to think about. So they kind of said, hey, we're going to make you think about this here and at least say, yeah, I don't want to think about it and throw away the exception, right? So, right. So I'm not arguing uh, the, the whole, there was a return code that got ignored, I think it's bad. So it, w if Go says what you, I know Elm does this, if what gets returned has the possibility of an error code, you must handle it. You absolutely must handle. Okay, fine. That made me think about the problem, even if all I'm going to do is like, ah, and throw again, right? Great. Um, for the Elm's use case, that works out great. I haven't played enough with Go, but I'm hearing people say, and I had to catch, and there's nothing I could do, so I returned. I'd say, if error return, if error return, if error return, and I'm saying, 
why not go ahead and have that be an exception because that's freaking what an exception is doing for you. It's crawling the stack up until somebody comes along and says, yeah, and wait a second, I can, I can do something now. But the, the reason that you have to put in the, the syntax there is kind of your way of promising you know, the author of the programming language that, yeah, I, rem I thought about the return code right, that I didn't check before, and I, decided, I, I explicitly decided I don't want to deal with it. Right? I'm going to pass it up the stack. Right? I, I am claiming so by, default, the, it, by default I don't want to deal because I don't know what I'm doing with it. Right. There is a high level where I know from the application standpoint, oh, it's a web server and this is a request and I'm just going to recycle and go get the next request and I'm just going to kill it and that's my recovery. So I know I can recover. Most of the time in the in-between layers, I don't know and I don't want to even think about it. It's not, nothing I can do here anyhow. All I'm going to do is bail out. That should be the default. Yeah. It's remember a great um, um, uh, model for uh, Oracle to get money which is instead of having a check it exception, you can send uh, just a penny to Oracle and you don't need uh, to check, to catch yeah, that exception at <laughs> that point. And, and who's son had thought of that, you know, maybe they never would have gotten acquired. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Regarding the sanity of the exceptions, I would say that uh, Erlang has it quite, quite nicely done, the letter crash philosophy. Because when you don't know what to do with the exception, you don't have any code that can recover. You just let it crash and you can restart the program. Of course, if there are cases when you're after, for example, error reporting, like say I have a REST service and somebody sends wrong arguments and I don't want my REST service to come down each time they do this, so then you're actu actually after error reporting, so that's another case. So you have at least two cases to solve. The first case would be when you just want to the default handling, and if you just had a queue or a coroutine, as Remy said earlier, then that would be a nice handler for it. There's an easy way to solve that one uh, with existing, and this is uh, you take whatever function you have and you wrap another layer around it that says, while forever, try, catch everything, and restart the application from scratch, which is pretty much what Erlang does. True. <laughs> well, you had to, and the other case you talked about, I would claim, is an instance where it's uh, interesting control flow, but not exceptional behavior. I kind of expect people to screw up arguments uh, to e APIs, and so I should handle that as a normal thing. So I would say we have a handleable error, so something we can handle. For example, a UI, GUI, whatever, we practically need to loop and ask the user for better output. Or we have the error which we can't handle and we just crash and Let's go. And somebody above us will handle it. So for instance, array index out of bounds exception, I've never seen anyone throw it intentionally for real as a recoverable error. But null pointers happen all the time, and I want to do null pointer handling smart. You know, Kotlin's got a good answer here, and this should have been an answer all along, but there's something to do with nulls that's different from array index out of bounds exception. And what does it mean when my low-level library throws an array index out of bounds, and he doesn't know how to handle it? Ah, you know, who's going to recover from that one, right? You have to come up here. <laughs> come on. Come on. It was a joke. Huh? Come on. <laughs> yeah. So, so you said you you haven't you haven't ever seen a ray out of bounds exception used, and I've seen it. And you, the people have the long counted loops, and they don't want to check the predicate for the for the index. And instead, they said, "Hey." The runtime will throw this exception for me, and that's about it. But it, I think it boils down to the same educational thing. The, the whole this language design thing is about um, disabusing users from doing stupid stuff and kind of pushing them to do the right stuff, right? I, I want to make it really hard for the users to do stupid stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but still, um, you have enumerated these cases where you want, what do you want to do with exceptions, right? When you want to just propagate it, when you want to log and rethrow, and if you want to process it right now. Ah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, syntactically, you would still have to disambiguate these cases somehow, right? So how do you disambiguate the case when you have to log something and rethrow? and the case that you are logging something and this is your recovery and you just shun the exception. Ah, so that's easy. I, yeah, you say, say try and catch finally and try and catch and go on. Yeah, okay. Okay, I'm going to switch gears here slightly and I'm going to be one that's going to talk in defense 
of checked exceptions. Right. Now, whether we like the mechanism or not, whether we like the mechanism or not, the one thing that it does do is it means that I don't have anything surprising coming at me out of a framework that I'm only going to catch at the highest level. Holy shit, of course you do. Well, okay, you're right, I do, but it's, so I would say, fewer things that are going to come out that are surprising. I would claim most of the checked exceptions I end up handling are surprising to me. You're right. throwing that? Okay. What the hell? Okay. And I don't know what to do with it if you're throwing it, so what am I going to do? So I was, you, you're absolutely right. If you don't know what you're doing with it, then you need to pass it along. Just like what you said. I understand. And a lot of this is design overreach. People making assumptions that they neither don't need to nor shouldn't make. And the prime example is I look in a hash map, I don't find the key, and it throws an exception, element not found. That's an overreach in design, right? It's up to the upper layer to decide if that's a desirable result or this is something bad has happened. But to make that des design decision at that level is incorrect. So this really comes down to education, right? Um, but I don't like frameworks throwing exceptions that are unchecked because I obviously... What's that? I'm glad you're under this job of educating everybody. Well, yeah. yeah. Let me give you an example of someone who needs a little He's education. He's doing a better job. Yeah. For example, look, look at the streams library. The streams library is difficult to use because of exceptions. Almost everything is a lambda. Those lambdas are not allowed to throw any exception. And that's just foolishness on the part of the API designers. The API designers should have seen the use case that most of those things that you do will throw exceptions. And instead of having the various uh, function interfaces be declared with methods that can only throw runtime exceptions, they should have just made it like callable where it throws any exception. And then it would have been abundantly clear. If I want to iterate over some big old stream and each of the steps could throw an exception, that the behavior that I actually want is when one of those things happens, then the iteration should fail and I should figure out how to do that. To do that right now means that I have to throw things, uh, I have to catch everything, I have to throw a runtime exception, then I have to catch the runtime exception and tease it all apart. That could have been easily avoided by designing a library that understands that exceptions are a thing that can happen. Uh, that's, of course, nope. what checked exceptions were provided to, to guide us to, and they've m completely missed their guidance. Oh. So, uh, basically, it's very hard to um, design a library that will work with checked exception and unchecked exception. We tried. Yes, and then you erred in the wrong direction. It should have simply said, just, just make all of these things throw an exception, so, and, uh, and in that case, you just then exception has happened. You give up on the thing. That's what in practice you condemn to do by hand. Except now it's my fault. Uh, so basically, is no. Um, uh, so uh, um, basically, when we have designed the stream API. Um, we come with a very complex design with check it exception and check it exception, and basically so, you, you you slam the wall of uh, let's say why check it exception are bad. Check it exception are bad because you are now in a world where you have two view of the same function. You have the function with check it exception and you have your function without check it exception, and that doesn't compose well. So we just have to get rid of check at exception. No. But currently... Uh, rap time, no. Rap time. No, no, and no. Ra ra no. As you, I'm going to let Cliff rap. I'm going to just say no. You've missed the intent of the two different uh, exception systems, and they actually do blend. But you have to think about it. <laughs> OK, I'm going to hold on to the mic, even as I see people running for it. That's, that's, so I, I've had to deal with this in a different way, just another perspective on this. Uh, JRuby is dynamic language. Any particular path is potentially any exception. Um, check exceptions are a way of statically forcing people to handle these things. But what we end up doing is just propagating them dynamically anyway. And that's the only way we know how to handle these things. Like IO exception in Java can represent one of a dozen different possible error conditions that I don't know anything about. There's some low level thing. So. I'm, I'm on the side of the check exceptions are just more hassle than they're worth, and we should be treating these in some other way.
All right, now I'm going to hold on to the mics <laughs> in an effort to wrap up. So I, 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 I'll see if I can see if I can come through with some uh, unified wisdom here. Um, Obviously, there's a lot of conflicting opinions. I think there is a, an agreement that checked exceptions, while they can be made to work, are very difficult to get to work well and are commonly not used well. Um, I'll, I'll say there's a consensus that uh, throwing away information in an exception path that you do not handle completely is bad and also fairly common in the Java world. Um, and people had worked around it in various ways. Um, there was a, a definite uh, go bash on if you had to handle the exception um, and all you would do is then turn around and say, I don't know, go away. Um, it was very painful as your call stacks got large to repeatedly say, if error, throw error or return error or whatever, that that was, you wanted some syntactic sure to cover up for that one. Um, Yeah, right. So no one had an answer to my question. Um, I didn't hear anyone bash me harshly about the whole, uh, there is one point where you'll catch it and you're done. And I don't care what you do there, you caught it and, you're, and it's done, done. But if you're not done, done, you cannot throw any information away, although you might want to add information or be able to add information. Um, I, said, I said that already. Automatic chaining is a way to prevent people from accidentally throwing away or by design throwing away where I've debugged lots of cases where very low level caught, threw away, threw something unrelated and you had no clue and the breadcrumb was lost. And that's a wrap.